Okay, let's start. Uh, it's great to have uh, Fernando Granham, uh, Geronimo from IAS, and they will talk about how to get almost a Manujan expanders from operations. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Ron, and uh, th thank you very much for the invitation. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. So we, we have this long title that we need to decode, right? Uh, so that there is this almost Ramanujan, right? Uh, that there is expanders. We have this arbitrary and also this operator amplification, which is going to be the technique, right? Uh, so th th this is going to be based on on joint work with. Uh, we have to shunt metal from New Chicago, Surya Roy from the Riverside, and Avid from the Institute, right? Uh, and uh, okay, and very formally, our main result is the following, right? Uh, any expander graph X can be transformed to an almost optimal expander. And uh, we need to dissect what, what we mean by almost optimal in this context. And whenever you talk about expander graphs, you typically need to talk about the family of expanders. But for, for simplicity, let, let, let's think that we have a, an expander and we are making it almost up. So th that's the, the main goal of the talk, would be to describe this, uh, this result. And uh, you have this machine, some transformation that will take some expander and it's going to output a, a, a modern almost optimal expander for you. And uh, as you might expect, we, are not, we shouldn't be allowed to completely ignore the expander that we received as input and return a completely new expander, right? Uh, we know optimal constructions of expanders, right? We could completely ignore the input and output one almost optimal expander in this way. So it's really important to preserve structural properties of the input expander in some way. And th that, that's going to have applications. So if you can preserve the uh, structural properties, that's going to be very useful. So in the cartoon picture, if you start with that expander there that was not optimal, you need to transform to something that's almost optimal, but it still retains properties of the original of your original input uh, expander. Okay, so that, that that's going to be the goal. And let's just detail some properties that the transformation that we have that is going to preserve. So the first property is that the vertex set is the same. So it, the, the the new and the old graph they have the same vertex set. The edges of the new graph they, they correspond to short walks. In, 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 in the original graph. So you're not creating transitions that were not there in the graph. And this is important, right? Uh, you're not changing the connectivity of the graph in some sense, right? Uh, in, in a very strong way. So all the new edges, there are going to be short walks in the original graph, right? Um, and uh, it preserves the type, right? Uh, if you have a Kelly graph, which is a special kind of graph over some group, then this property is going to preserve, be preserved. So it, if, you, if the input graph was a Kelly graph over a group, it remains a Kelly graph over the same group. And, and that, that's a, very useful. And uh, another property, just to say, is that if the graph was monotone, or whatever monotone means, the output graph is also monotone. It's not important what monotone means, it's just to say that a lot of the properties are preserved. Okay, And uh, it's very useful in applications. So several times you might, in your application, you, you might need to work with a given expander. Right, uh, you need to perform a random walk or on a certain graph, right? Uh, but but, but it, it may not be an optimal expander, right? Uh, so you really would like to somehow convert it to an optimal, optimal expander. So in several applications, you are forced to, to, to work with a given expander graph. So th th that's something important, right? Uh, and the key point is that for, for those applications, we can make all those arbitrary expanders almost optimal, right? Uh, so this is uh, uh, the, the useful thing going on here. Very good. And let's start from the basics and let, let's set some notation. Okay. So X for us is going to be a graph. And you are going to work with regular graphs, right? Uh, so each vertex is incident to the same number of edges, right? In this case, we have three, right? A three regular graph. And uh, okay, so X is the name of a graph. We have vertex at B and the collection of edges, what, what, what you all know, right? Uh, assume that's the regular. Uh, a very useful object that you associate to a graph is the adjacency matrix, or sometimes normalized adjacency matrix. So here we, uh, we form a matrix in R V cross V, right, uh, indexed by uh, uh, pairs of vertices, and we put a one in the, this corresponding entry if there is an edge between I and J, and zero otherwise. And it's going to be convenient to normalize, to divide by one over D, so, 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 so that things are going to be uniform and you're going to be able to compare the objects, okay? And um, 
why do you do that, right? We started with this very combinatorial object, now we have a matrix, right? Uh, and having matrices is very useful, right? Uh, because, uh, before we, we say why it's useful, let, let's give a very simple example, the, the, the triangle, right? Uh, the, the triangle, each vertex is connected to the two other guys in the graph, right? You only have three. There is no self loops, right? So the diagonal entries are zero, but all the other entries are one. And the degree here is two, so we have this one over two uh, times that. So this is the normalized adjacent matrix of a triangle. And if, if at any point something is not clear in terms of notation and so on, please let me know. Um, okay. And uh, why people like to, to go to this other representation? Because now you have this matrix, you can study algebraic properties of this matrix to deduce properties of X and vice versa. Properties of the graph that, that we, we uh, are going to imply algebraic properties of, of AX. And linear algebra is something, for, for instance, that we understand reasonably well, and you, you can use a lot of linear algebra, algebraic tools here. Right, uh, to, to, to study the graph X. So that, that's a big motivation. Right? Uh, and uh, at a very informal level, what you want from an expander? You want two properties, right, that, that are opposed. Right? Uh, typically, you, you always want something that's in tension. You want the graph to be very well connected, right, uh, because it, it's good to, to have a robust network somehow. And at the same time, you want the graph to be sparse, right, uh, have few edges. And those things are in opposition, right? If you have a graph with few edges, how come it will be well connected, right? Uh, but, but at a qualitative level, that, that's what an expander tries to achieve, at least for, for this talk. And um, okay, and uh, th there are many ways to, to work with expanders. You, you can work in terms of combinatorics, trigger constants. You can work in terms of random walks, and you are going to take this spectral approach, right? That you're going to look at this. Adjacent matrix, normalized adjacent matrix, and they're going to study its properties. Okay, so they're going to, and they are morally equivalent in some regimes, right? Uh, and if you want to really nuance dependencies, that they are very different in some points as well. Okay, but let's take the, the spectral world. And a guy that's very important since you're playing with the regular graphs is this all ones vector, this all ones direction. So this is a very important guy. Why? Because we are going to see that this is an eigenvector. It's always an eigenvector to eigenvalue one of the normalized adjacent matrix. Right? Uh, we recall that we normalize by the degree. So each guy is connected to the other parts. It's a D regular graph. And you divide the entry by one over D. So each of the rows of the adjacent matrix forms a probability distribution. Right? Uh, so when AX interacts with the ones, it spits out the ones for us. Okay? So we have an eigenvector. It's an eigenvector to eigenvalue one. Very good. So here in the, the example, uh, we have precisely that, right? Uh, so we have our triangle, and you, you can see that it's, it's indeed an eigenvector to eigenvalue one. And that, that, that was convenient, uh, right? Uh, to, to work with the regular graphs. And uh, we have this real symmetric matrix, right? Uh, and we, we know that the rows, they form probability distribution. So we know that the eigenvalues are between one and minus one. Well, let's say that we have an any vertex graph. So we have any eigenvalues, right? Uh, we, we have just seen that one is achieved. So we always have eigenvalue one, right? Uh, and, and, and then uh, the, the smallest one is at least minus one, okay? And they, they, they are real and you can sort them in this way, okay? Now we can define uh, the spectral expansion of a graph. What, what we're going to do, we are going to look at uh, the absolute value of the second one and the absolute value of the last one. And they're going to take the maximum of the two. Right, uh, this is going to give us a number between zero and one. Right, uh, this gives us a, a number of between zero and one, and this is called the spectral expansion, or this is the two-sided spectral expansion because you are looking at lambda two and, and lambda. A. Okay, and uh, for for this, okay, so in the example of a triangle, what do we have? Right, we had this adjacent matrix. It, it decomposes. You can see, right, uh, this, this is all ones, outer product all ones. This is sort of the all ones matrix, right? This guy here is a range one matrix. The all ones matrix. That's the all ones, all other product all ones. We need to remove the diagonal, so we have minus identity, so we have this expression. And from this, it's easy to, to read the eigenvalues, right? Uh, so the all ones, you know, it's an eigenvector, right? And you know that it has eigenvalue one, right? Uh, and and the, the other eigenvectors, they are orthogonal to this part. So they live here. So we have minus a half and minus a half as the other eigenvalues. And, and then lambda k3, right, uh, is a half. It's the absolute value of the true. Okay. And for, for this talk, if this if lambda x is at most lambda, we call this graph a lambda expander. Okay. Very good. That's just a definition. 
for, 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 for the star. And the, the, the spectral theory gives us more, right? Uh, we have this real symmetric matrix. We know that we have or, or not orthonormal bases of eigenvectors, right? Uh, so in particular, th th this guy is our orthonormal basis. And you can write the adjacent matrix in this form. Or if you write in, in, in this orthonormal basis, the matrix becomes diagonal, right? And, and that, that's very easy to understand what happens to powers of this matrix. So a, a good mental picture that, that, that I like to have when I'm thinking about spectral expansions like this, we know that lambda one is one. And by the definition, all the other eigenvalues, they are at most lambda in absolute value. So this is roughly, in our mind, something that resembles something like this. One and a bunch of lambdas here. And lambda should be thought as something small. So as we take powers of this guy, we have an exponential decay in lambda. If you raise this guy to the t, right, uh, the, 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 these other entries, they are going to become lambda to the t. They are shrinking, right? Uh, and then the top entry remains the same. Okay, so this implies fast convergence, right? Uh, if lambda is small. Another way to see that uh, lambda is small implies good expansion is like this, right? Uh, so you have this decomposition, you, you separate uh, the, this, uh, the, the top eigenvector, <coughs> that's the, this all ones, uh, auto product all ones, this is J matrix, right? Uh, and, and the rest. And if lambda is small, it means that all those lambdas here, they are quite small. So in terms of operator norm, it's as if your adjacent matrix here behaves like this guy here, the adjacent matrix of this guy. But the adjacent matrix of this guy is the adjacent matrix of a complete graph, right? Uh, every guy is connected here with self loops, even, right? Uh, so this is the most expanding thing that you could have, right? Uh, for, 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 for a graph. So at least spectrally, your, your graph here somehow is going to exhibit properties of something that's extremely well connected, right? Uh, very good. So that, that's why having lambda small is good. And uh, why should we bother about studying expanders? And I think expanders are a fascinating role, especially if, if you're a beginning grad student, I think it's highly advisable to, 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 to learn more about expanders. So one place that they shine is, is in code constructions. So the, the, the relation here is quite direct. And to, to name some results, right, we have the optimal, almost optimal, the explicit almost optimal codes of Tashman, right, uh, uh, breakthrough some years ago. We have the recent breakthroughs, uh, breakthrough of Genoa et al, of uh, C3 LTCs, right? Uh, constant rate, constant gist, constant uh, uh, queries, right? Uh, locally testable codes. We have the celebrated expander codes of, of C per spume, right? Uh, that have very efficient decoding. We have now the quantum codes of Pantaleev and Kalachov, right? Uh, so an, another breakthrough this year. And uh, major theorems in computer science can be proved using expanders. So Genoa has a, a, a proof of the PCP theorem that uses expanders. We have the DSL de Cauchwell result of Ringold that, that's essentially transforming uh, a graph into an expander. Right? Uh, in the randomization, right? Sometimes we have an algorithm where we want to construct some explicit objects, right? Uh, so we have epsilon bias distributions, we have expander Chernoff. It gives us a lot of tools in, in the randomization. Uh, algorithm design, right? We have several expander decompositions. Chacha Ch 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 has beautiful expander decompositions here, right? Uh, so very good. Uh, we have beautiful, the constructions are very nice. It's nice to, the combinatorial, it's nice to construct these objects. So we have the, the zigzag product of, of Ringgold, Vakadana, and Vigdars, right? Uh, it's a, 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 such a simple and beautiful way of constructing expanders that people found a lot of applications to, to, to the zigzag idea. And uh, we have also the high order version of the zigzag of Menaroy and Tashma. And I'm highlighting these two this results because we are going to build on them, right? Uh, so they are going to be crucial for us here, these two uh, results. Uh, inheritance of approximation, right? Some problems, small set expansion, SSC, it is a problem about expansion of graphs. So the, even the, the, the nature of the problems are there. The two to two games, uh, a, a brief step before any games, right? Uh, uses expansion, right? In, in some of the tests there. We mentioned sampling and counting, right? Uh, if you want to, to sample, approximately sample proper coloring of a graph, approximately sample some independent set of, of the graph, right? Uh, so it's, it's used there. So it's, uh, it's really, I think, fundamental. And uh, the way that I see is that it, it's a powerful spice. You, you have your application, and then you drop some expander there. You get a lot of non-triviality out of that. Right? Uh, so if you see me before expanders and after expanders, expanders give you a lot of leverage. So I think it's a very cool, cool thing to use in applications. And now that you understand this lambda parameter, we can make the, our wish list more quantitative. Right? Uh, we had this qualitative wish list that has asked for a graph to be well connected and sparse. Now we know that well connected in the spectral sense means that this lambda parameter is small, right? Uh, we want this lambda parameter to be small. And the sparse means that the degree is small. 
you have a regular graph. So the number of edges is n times d over two, right? Uh, so D is controlling how sparse is the graph, right? Uh, so typically one lambda is small and d is small. But as you might expect, th th there are trade-offs, right? Uh, and uh, people ask, right? Uh, the expansion having a small lambda is great, but how much do I need to pay in terms of the degree? How, how many edges do I need to, to, to achieve this, this kind of expansion, right? Uh, and uh, an important bound in this direction is the lower bound, right? Uh, it, it, it tells you, uh, depending on the degree, how, how, a lower bound on the spectral expansion. So uh, this is called the Allen-Bopana bound. So here you have a family of bound degree expander uh, graphs, right? Uh, so th th they all need to satisfy this property asymptotically. And we have this morally quadratic gap, right? We have degree D, and then the expansion needs to be at least one over the square root of D. But let's rephrase it in a different way. Let's say that you want to get a lambda expander, how much at, we need you to invest in terms of the degree at least. So if you want to get a lambda expander, we need to invest at most, at least as much to get a lambda expander. So if you want to get an expansion is good, small lambda is good, but it, it, if you want to get it, at least you need to pay this much, right? A quadratic trade-off between lambda and the degree. Very good. And th there is a, a bound called the Ramanujan bound, and it establishes more like this quadratic trade-off. So graphs that uh, have this bound that the lambda parameter is about one over uh, square root of d, th they are known as Ramanujan graphs. And then somehow they, they try to mimic spectral properties of regular trees, right? A finite regular trees. So we have this um, perfect orbit somehow, and the, this finite graph is going to try to mimic so, so, some spectral properties of this perfect orbit. And the Ramanujan bound is the best that you could achieve, given that the down bopana bound establishes a lower bound, right? Uh, so if you have a graph satisfying this, it's, it's going to be the best of the best. And uh, in the 80s, uh, Lubotsk, Phillips, and Sarnik, uh, and independent Margulis, they, they use uh, group theory and they use conjectures that, that are solved in, in number theory to construct Ramanujan graphs. So they, they showed explicit Ramanujan graphs. And since those graphs are optimal, in a lot of places, people, in applications, people just go to those constructions and use in their applications, right? Uh, if you need an expander, sometimes you might as well get one very, very good one. So they, they are used in a lot of places, right? Uh, TCS and so on. So th this was in the 80s, so that it was the first explicit construction. And uh, yeah, and somewhat more recently, uh, it was shown that bipartite graphs of every degree, they exist by Marcus Spielman and City Bastard using some lifting, beautiful lift, lifting techniques. And you do not know if, if Ramanujan graphs exist for every degree that's possible. So this is a big open problem here, right? Uh, because for, from the first result, people thought, oh, they might be very special, that there might be number theoretical reasons, right? Uh, but, but this somehow dispelled this thing, right? Uh, okay, that there are other construction that achieve every degree, okay? Okay, so those are the best of the best, right? Uh, and uh, you can ask generically, right? If you take a random regular graph, how, how close it's going to be from, from being uh, amazing, right? Uh, and what Friedman showed is that uh, indeed it's going to, oh, here you need to normalize by D, but that Friedman showed that you get something very close to the Ramanujan bound. So you have just a, a little term here. So in a generic sense, uh, almost Ramanujan graphs are very abundant, right? Uh, and, and they are super close to, 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 to the Ramanujan bound. But uh, as we know, sometimes even having random things, it's not easy to, to put our hands uh, in one of those, right? Uh, so, okay. And uh, the, the question that we ask is that, uh, we, I don't know, we have our application, we are facing some expanders, right? Uh, it's good that they are expanders, but how close we can make the expanders that we have uh, get them closer to the Ramanujan bound? Is there some way that in our, in our application can start with those expanders and make them better, right? Uh, so that, that, that's somehow the question that, uh, uh, we investigated, and the answer, as we hinted before, is that th this is always possible in a generic way, right? Uh, so uh, again, to talk about expansion, you need to talk about the uh, infinite family, but let us keep things simple. So let's say that you are given a, a, an input expander X, right, uh, wh which has expansion parameter lambda naught, and the degree is, is d naught, and let's say that this lambda parameter is a constant for, for, for us, right? Uh, and for any target expansion lambda that you want to, to achieve, right, uh, we can efficiently transform this X into a lambda expander so that the expansion is what we wanted, right? Uh, but at the same time, the degree becomes this, right? Uh, it becomes the original degree divided by lambda squared uh, plus a little old term. So if you started with a graph that had did not been constant and, and as lambda 
becomes smaller and smaller, the trade-off between lambda and the degree is going to become more and more like quadratic trade-off. You have lambda expansion with, with one over lambda squared. Okay. So he, here we have this little term that uh, so you, you are not as close to our illusion bound as in Friedman's result, right? Uh, so th th there is a lot of research which should be done to improve this this dependence, right? Uh, but we, now we are more get, getting something that's almost quadratic, right? The lambda expansion with one over lambda square plus some little. Uh, very good. And uh, if you can say very quickly what was the, the, the proof techniques. So uh, I mentioned that Ashma had a breakthrough result in coding theory, right? Constructing explicit binary codes. <laughs> And you very crudely, what you're going to do, you're going to take his amplification techniques for far scalars, and you're going to make the, the operator version, matrix version of, of these techniques, right? Uh, and uh, the, the, the proof should generalize in a very natural way. And uh, since you, you are going to start from there, let's let start with Tashma's amplification, right? Uh, so the main technical thing that Tashma uses in this code construction is some sort of amplification of bias of binary of Boolean functions, right? Uh, functions that are plus minus ones. And let's try to parse this statement. So the, the key tech we reach in, in, in the construction of almost all from codes of Tashma comes from this amplification. And here you're giving some finite set S, you are giving some um, lambda naught parameter, right? As a, to be thought as a constant. And for any target lambda, it's possible to efficiently construct a collection of subtuples of S to the T, right? Uh, and T here is going to be a, about log one over uh, lambda. So it's about the, the correct side. And the size of this collection is, is going to be almost optimal for, for this amplification. So you, you, you pay by the size of S and you have this lambda square plus little, right? Uh, and what it gives, what this collection W of tuple gives is the following, right? Uh, so we start with a function, it, it maps elements of S to plus minus ones, right? Uh, and then we look at the average of this function, right? Uh, and this is the bias, right? This is telling us that the difference between plus ones and minus ones that you see. And you're saying that this is at most lambda naught. Right, uh, and what happens if you have this bias, if the bias is not too large of this function to begin with, what are going to form is like this. You're going to take a, a, a tuple here, S1 all the way to ST, and uh, what you're going to do for it, this tuple, you're going to evaluate a, a F of S1, F of S2, all the way to F of ST, and you're going to multiply, right? Uh, and you're going to compute this average, right? Uh, it, it's as if now each tuple here, you have a new function that maps tuples, to plus minus ones, and it maps in this way but by taking the products like this. And now the, the bias of this new function is going to be your desired bias, lambda. So you, you wanted to start with some function, you think that lambda naught is, a, is, 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 is a, a bound away from one, but potentially large. And, and, and now after you do this, the, the, this product here uh, along the, the tuples, you get something that's very small. So that, that's what, what's going on. And uh, it, it's easy to get something small. But uh, what's non trivial here is that the support side that we are achieving this lambda, it has this form here. And, and this is an almost solved from trade off. Okay. So this was the main uh, technical ingredient in Tashman. And uh, so achieving lambda with a W that this has the support size is, is, is very good. Okay. Uh, and let, let's put in. Oh, okay. Good. Is there dependence on the lambda zero? Yeah, you are going to think that lambda naught is, is a constant in this point. If it's if it depends on the other parameters, it becomes it becomes it can become ugly. Yes, it can become ugly. You think that's a constant bound away from one, but uh, it, it, amplification works even if it's very close to one. Uh, but but, 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 but parameters suffer. Uh, but, uh, amplification happens, but but uh, yeah, so lambda naught is should be thought as, as some constant. And to, to, to put Tashman's result in perspective, right? Uh, so in, in the 50s, more or less, in the 50s, in the 40s, we, you had two models of coding theory. One was the Henning model, the adversarial model, that's very common in TCS. And you also had the channel, channel model that appeared. But let's focus on the Henning model, right? Uh, that there, there is a channel, and the, the, the channel is sort of an adversary. It allows you to corrupt, to flip symbols as, as it likes, but there is only a bound on the number, of, on the fraction of symbols that the, the channel is allowed to, to change. But there is no computation, no other assumption on the chain, right? Uh, so it's a very strong model, it's a very strong error model. And in the 50s already, people saw, oh, if you take random codes, you achieve very interesting parameters. And this is called the Gilbert version of bound, right? Uh, if you take random codes, you have uh, a distance half minus epsilon and, and rate uh, about epsilon square. 
you actually get something more. You get that, that, that the Hemingway of cold words are very close to a half. That's called the notion of epsilon balanced. But let's not bother too much. So this was the parameters of random codes that we, we, we know that they are near optimal in some sense. And what Ashma got is, 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 is something that uh, instead of epsilon squared, there is a little O. And the little O comes from, from this part here in the amplification. And uh, it took many years for a construction that achieves quadratic, right? Uh, about lambda square to appear. In the 90s, we already had something that was polynomial in epsilon, then epsilon cube. But it really, the, the, this uh, the about epsilon squared was with Ashman. OK, now let's try to gain some intuition, right? That we want to amplify bias, right? We have some bias lambda naught, and we want to, to achieve bias lambda. How should we go about, right? Uh, and the most naive thing, right, when you're, you're trying to amplify things is take a product space, right? Uh, if you take W to be all collection of tuples, right, uh, of this size here, right, uh, you're taking a very dense collection, th th then it's a product space. So this expectation is going to, to, to reduce to this form here. So we have T copies, right, uh, of lambda naught up here. So we have a very beautiful decay of lambda naught to the T. Right, uh, so if you take the full product space, all the tuples, something that's very dense, right, uh, then this expectation here breaks into a product and you have a beautiful decay, right? Uh, and we, we here we choose lambda at t to, 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 to give the lambda in the end. But as you might expect, if, if you do things very naively, we are paying too much, right? Uh, now the size of the collection that we have is huge, right? Uh, it's S. To, to, to this much, it's not even linear, right? Uh, on the on the parameters, right? Uh, and in terms of code, it means that we leave uh, the, the the range of good codes. So th this is way too bad. We really need to have a one here instead of something B. So it was too dense. It was too dense when, when we did that. Okay, uh, and and then a second approach, right? Uh, so you, we, we saw that we, we hit the, the correct lambda with this D, right? Uh, but it was too dense. So one thing that you can do is just subsample, right? Uh, let's take a sparse collection of this guy instead of taking everything, right? Uh, and if you take a sparse collection of about this size, you can run a churn of bound plus human bound to show that uh, with high probability for every function of this form that we have, it, it's, the, the amplification is going to be about correct. And, and, and this is about the correct size. So uh, if you have two, two, two to the size of S functions like this, and if you take a collection of about this size, churn of bound plus union bound gives a bias of, of about this much. Okay, and very good. But what is the issue? We, we knew running constructions of codes from the 50s, right? Uh, so the, the, the difficulty was making them explicit, right? Uh, so this W is not explicit at all. It has good parameters, right? Uh, uh, but, but unfortunately, it's not explicit. And this is a talk about expanders. And we mentioned that expanders are good in their randomization. How should we try to avoid using randomness here? Right? Uh, we could try to bring auxiliary expanders to help us. Right? Uh, so what is possible, we can try to randomize this construction using expanders. Right? Uh, bring expanders to, to remove the randomness here. Well, let, let's see how it goes. So the first solution is you start, let's say that you have an auxiliary expander x on the vertex set s. And you can think that the, 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 so the vertex set is s. So you can think that at each vertex, we have an evaluation of S, right? Uh, so we have plus minus one values on the vertices, right? Uh, and uh, instead of taking the, 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 the full color, uh, the, the S to the T, right? Something that's very dense. Now you're going to take walks on this expander. And if this expander is bounded degree, the, the number of tuples that are going to generate is going to be much, much smaller, oh, right? Because it's not S to the T, it's going to be S times the small degree to the T, right? Uh, so it, it, achieve, it achieves much better trade-offs already. And you'd expect that expanders should behave as something like random, right? Uh, so if you can make the, the, the intuition work, we are good, right? Uh, so the, the first construction there is, is to take an, an expander graph and take the collection of all short walks on this expander <laughs> and hope that it behaves somehow as random, right? Uh, this is quite good, but it does not achieve all from parameters, right? Uh, it gives something that's about epsilon to the four, right? Uh, and the, we are looking for something about epsilon squared, right? Uh, and what's going to happen is that uh, we de randomize the random using expanders. Now use expanders again to, to de randomize the, the, the collection of walks. Now, instead of considering all walks there, try to consider a, a, a de randomized collection. And the way to select this de randomized collection is by what is called this high order zigzag. Uh, 
So to put it more formally, there's sort of a product graph of a regional expander and another expander that's called the SY zigzag product. That, that's a technical term. And it appeared in the work of Ben Arroyo and, and Tashma uh, in 2000, around 2008. So th th that was what happened. And, but here in this talk, in our work, we are trying to give a matrix analog, an operator analog here. So instead of having functions that are plus minus one value, right, uh, as before, now what we're going to have is functions that match matrices, right? Uh, so this MLC is L by L matrices over the complex, right? Uh, so instead of placing plus minus one singles on, on the verts of, uh, right, uh, we are going to put matrices, larger dimensional matrices. And you can ask the same questions, right? Uh, that, that does it, is, is there some amplification phenomenon going on, right? Uh, but, but, but now we have this dimension added to, 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 to be careful, right? Uh, and uh, the, the, the main technical theorem that we show is, is this analog here. And you also need to quantify how close things are. Before we have absolute values, right? Quantifying biases. But now we have larger matrices. So we need a different norm to quantify biases. That's going to be the operator norm. But let, let, let's parse this slowly, the main uh, amplification. So again, we have this finite set S. We, we have this lambda node parameter. And we have a dimension parameter L. And again, for any target lambda, we can efficiently construct now a sparse collection of S to the T, su such that this collection has about the right size. And you are going to see why this is the right size. And for, for any function that, that's a matrix value now, we, there is a time condition that we require the operator norm to be at most one of each of these matrix. But let, let's ignore this for this talk. If, the, if the, average, the, the average of this function now gives us a matrix, right? Uh, and you can ask for the operator norm for the largest singular value of this matrix should be at most lambda naught. And if this happens, now we can construct, we can evaluate over tuples. You are going to take products here. The, the, those are matrix products, right? Uh, and you can ask again, this is going to a new function on tuples, right? Uh, that are products of, of the original function. And you can ask about the operator norm. What happens to the operator norm? And the, the operator norm is going to shrink, right? Uh, and notice if L is equal to one, you would have the operator norm be absolute values, right? Uh, and, and then you would recover the, 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 the Tashman scale amplification. So th this is the matrix version, the operator version of, of Tashman. Okay? And uh, two curious things that are happening here, I think. One is that uh, it, 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 it doesn't depend on L, right? Uh, it's dimension dependent in the sense, right? Uh, so if you want to achieve a parameter lambda here, the size of this collection does not depend on L at all. So if you want to amplify two by two matrices or three by three matrices or a bazillion times bazillion matrices, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, even in finite matrices, right? Uh, so, uh, okay, so it's dimension dependent with respect to L. And uh, another curious thing about this, I think, but it's not clear from how things are written here, is that we have this parameter, uh, we have this parameter, sorry, we have this parameter L, but uh, it, it, it should actually be a little bit below because it, 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 when you construct this collection, if you construct by, for two by two matrices, it works for three by three, it works for a hundred times a hundred. So single collection W can amplify finitely many functions, right? Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter the, 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 the function that you have. So it's a single object that's sort of universe. It amplifies infinitely many things at the same time, okay? And in the scalar case, the number of plus minus one functions that we had was finite, right? Uh, it was a, a fixed number. Okay, so now we need to talk about Cayley graphs. So part of our techniques that they're going to be related to what is called Cayley graphs. And Cayley graphs is something that we know uh, to, to some extent, right? Uh, most of you. So here we start with a finite group. And the vertex set of this graph is going to be the elements of the group, right? Uh, and we will take a generating set of this group. Let's say that's closed and inverse. And for every element in the group, you will take you will multiply it by all the generating sets, right? It's going to give edges, right? And for every G, you, you take an arbitrary generating element and you, you compute this S times G. It's going to give you edges of this form. So the graph that has vertex set G and edges of this form is the Cayley graph, right? Uh, it's the Cayley graph of, of the over the group G using the generating set S. And we, we in this talk we have already seen a, a, an expander graph, right? Uh, we have seen the, the, the this Z3, right? Uh, the, 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 Triangle is a KD graph. So you can think that the, the vertex set is Z3, right? Uh, and the generators is plus minus one. A, a, another beloved example for us is the Boolean hypercube, right? Uh, the Boolean hypercube is a, an example of a KD graph. So we have Z2 to the K, and then you have these base elements here. E1 of 2K. 
Very good. And now let's try to understand a little bit the structure of a KD graph. And when you have a KD graph over an abelian group, like the two to the K, right, that the, 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 the operation in the group commutes, we have Fourier analysis, right? The, the very familiar Fourier analysis should help us here. And the, what, what we're going to do here, we have all the characters, right? And the characters can be indexed by, by sets, right? Uh, sets from T. So here you have the trivial character, the, 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 the character related to set one, all the way to the full character. And we know that this, uh, the, the Fourier uh, functions, that they diagonalize this, the, the, this guy in the case of a billion case. So the picture is really simple, right? Uh, if you want to understand the eigenvalues of this guy, you write the matrix in, in, in the, the Fourier base, and you can read off from the diagonal, have zeros here. So the diagonal they are readily available, and they are of this form, right? Uh, very good. And the remark is that uh, uh, this graph is a lambda knot expander if and only if for every non trivial character, because we know that this guy is one, there is nothing that we can do about. But for all other guys, we, we need to have eigenvalue at most lambda knot. So it means that the, the, the expectation of S over this, this set of, that we have of chi to the t needs to be at most lambda knot. So this is an equivalent definition, right? Uh, and uh, we are going to see three different ways of expressing the same object. So th this was a KD graph, and, and, and this is a very important object in the CS as well. It has a, a special name. And the, what is the name? People typically, instead of using lambda, they, they, they use epsilons, right? Uh, and this is the notion of epsilon bias distribution, right? Uh, um, that when you have some multi set S of this form that fools for here characters, it's called an epsilon, balances, uh, epsilon bias distribution. And it's very useful. If you have a Boolean function that supports one few for your coefficients, you, you can try to understand the expectation, right? Uh, using uh, epsilon bias distribution. Okay. And uh, this concept of epsilon bias distribution has a yet another name, which is the notion of an epsilon balance code, right? Uh, this is yet another name. And uh, this potentially might be a little bit less obvious if you have not seen. So you can take the, the distribution, right? It's a multi set. And you can put those are elements in, in institution decay. And you can put them in rows like this. Let's say that the, the, the size of this multi set is a. You can put them in rows like this. And the claim is that this defines an epsilon balance code, right? Uh, because whenever you take a, a, a T, let's say a set, but, but now let's visualize the set as being a string in institution decay. Whenever you take a non trivial T like this, we know that uh, the inner product of this with T is going to be roughly balanced, right? Uh, the, the number of zeros and ones that we see is, is about the same because we had this condition in the Fourier uh, coefficients, right? For every non trivial guy, the bias that we see here, the bias of this guy is, is, is small, it's about F. So we have this, this other thing, right? Um, so an epsilon, a lambda expander is related to a lambda bias distribution, which is the same as a lambda balance code. And uh, so the, the heading weight of, of any guy, when you take a T that's not zero, it's in between, it's, it's about a half with an error of plus, uh, at, right? Okay. Uh, all right. So we, we have seen a little bit of how the, the abelian case and, and, and scalar functions might be useful. Now, if you want to, to understand general expanded graphs, you need to go to, uh, we need to generalize this notion of, of, of Fourier analysis, right? You need to work with more general notions. What do we do when you have a general finite group, right? Uh, and uh, this may not be familiar to, to everyone, but it's not very hard. It's just a new language that we need when you work with KD graphs over more general groups. And the, the, the Ramanujan expanders that I mentioned from Bobois, Philip Sarn, and Margulis, th th those are KD constructions. Uh, so the, the, it, it's in, the, the, they are quite important, right? Uh, and the, the Ramanujans that we have, they, they need to, they cannot be abelian. Uh, you should get very good trade-offs between degree and expansion you need to work with finite groups. And we need this notion of representation. Representation is just a, a function that maps group elements to uh, unitary matrices. So th th those are matrices that inverse is the conjugate transpose. Let's say you can think about some sort of rotation, right? The, the orthogonal group in the case of, of Reeves. That preserves a group operation, right? So you apply this. And uh, it's, it's somehow you're mapping your elements of the group to matrices in a way that it, it behaves as if you're in the group, right? Uh, so this is going to be a representation for us. And the goal is to capture the, the group structure somehow. We understand in algebra that we have this group, might be a complicated object. So let's let somehow uh, 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 use linear algebra to understand the group. And we have the set of what is called the irreducible representation, right? Uh, in the, the Fourier analysis, we have all, all the Fourier uh, characters there, right? Uh, but, but, but now we are going to have the collection of irreducibles, and th those are like whenever you have a representation, it, it decomposes as irreducible representations. 
So this is like the primes for, for representation theory. Those are the building blocks of representation theory. And uh, it, it's known that uh, because now things are not really <coughs> so you do not expect things to be diagonal because otherwise things would commute somehow. So when you can, but nonetheless, you can block diagonalize the decayed uh, Jason's matrix of, of a graph. And we know that it's formed by this many copies of each reducible. So this is the number of times of this average here. So before we had a character, a scalar valid function. But, but now we have efforts of matrix valid functions happening here, right? Um, and the observations that these guys want to be a lambda not expander, if, if and only if the averages, right, all over the reduced representations of the operator norm, that they, they, they are at most lambda not for every non trivial reduced representation. Uh, to, to make things a little bit concrete, uh, we, we can look at the symmetric group, right? Uh, just to show how it arises. So in the symmetric group, we can always map things to one, right? Uh, this is a one-dimensional thing, it's a trivial one. In permutations, we all have, have the sign representation, right? Plus minus one. So what is the sign of a permutation? Is a transposition, it's minus one, right? Uh, and it happens that we also have blocks of two, two by two dimensional matrices. Since this is a block of dimension two, it happens, uh, it occurs twice in, in this. Okay. And uh, expanding a little bit more, we have this two by two block, this two by two block, very good. And th this is just to, to give you a flavor, but it's not important what is going on in terms of representation theory. Well, what is important is that we, we are faced with matrices, with blocks that are matrices instead of just scalars, right? Uh, so th this is called, this representation is a matrix valid function for us, okay? All right, so now let's try to amplify, right? We have our main technical tool. Let, let's try to see how we can amplify. So one group that people, it was hard to show that the, how to find the constant size expanding generator sets for, for this group was a symmetric group. For a long time, people did not know, oh, is it possible to get bound degree expanders or not? And uh, in around 2005, Kasabov had a, a breakthrough result showing that, yes, it's possible. The symmetric group, you can get bound degree expanders, right? Uh, but the, the trade-off between the degree and the expansion of the symmetric group was, was far from, from, from the Ramanujan bound. So now let's use, start from Kasabov's generators and, and let's try to build something almost optimal out of this, right? Uh, and uh, okay, so we, let's apply the rest. So if you have a lambda, uh, if you have an expander that, that's lambda naught, it means that all the non trivial reducibles, they, on average, they have a greater norm at most lambda naught from what, what we've seen before, right? Uh, and uh, now if you apply the operator amplification to all the reduce, what you're going to get is the assumption is satisfied, the most lambda naught. But when you amplify, right, uh, when you consider this collection of tuples, the operator norm becomes lambda, it becomes much smaller, right? Uh, very good. And uh, we can use the homomorphism property, right? We said that this whole is in a way that uh, uh, applying OS1, blah, 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 is the same as multiplying side of, of the function, right? Uh, and with this, it allows to define a new set, right? A new generating set. So if you take all products like this, this gives us a new generating set. And from what we said, amplification happened, right? So the operator norm of every non trivial reducible is lambda. Very good. So we've got something that uh, for any desired lambda that you wanted, we managed to construct an explicit S prime that has expansion lambda. And the, the degree, since it was bound the degree to begin with, it's going to have this form. So it's going to have a near quadratic trade off. And the, the symmetric group is something that relates to graph isomorphism. It's something very natural, right? Uh, so the, the symmetric group, the Achille graph over the symmetric group has a lot of complications. Right? Okay. So now we know how to make the, the, these nearly optimal. So we, we start with Kasabov. Kasabov gave expansion, right? Uh, but not, not exactly uh, the, the best trade offs. And this machinery gives almost all optimal trade offs now for, 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 for the symmetric group. Okay. Very good. And uh, th th this extends, right? Uh, so if you go for general groups, it, it would also uh, the same proof, right? Uh, so whenever someone proves that a group has bound degree expanding generators, you apply this machine, and you can say that, that there are almost some non generators. So in particular, all on a billion finite simple groups have this property and, and many other groups, right? Uh, so it's a very generic way, right? Uh, and it, 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 we thought that groups would have different characteristics in terms of how well they would explain. So the, the groups coming from the LPS, the potential are very good, right? Uh, whereas the symmetric group potentially, would, I don't know, thought to be worse in terms of expansion. But all of them can have almost uh, Ramanujan. But we promise somehow to have almost Ramanujan for every graph, right? Uh, and uh, how can you get almost Ramanujan for every graph? It's going to be almost a reduction to the previous case. 
but not fully, right? Uh, so the, the, if you take a, a arbitrarily regular graph, you, there is a this is to show that you can decompose its normalized adjacent matrix as an average of permutation matrices. Th those are matrices that have exactly one zero, uh, one one per, per row and column, right? Otherwise, it's zero, right? Uh, so you can have this form here. So whenever you have a not regular graph, very good. And uh, now let's try to map things to group theory, right? In, in, in some way. And uh, the way that you can map, you can make any permutation matrix correspond to a permutation of the symmetric group on the vertices as a permutation on the vertices. And we, we know that this kind of decomposition here, we have the all ones direction, that's so, so, so sort of the, 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 the trivial space here, you have a one, and you have something that's orthogonal to it, right? Uh, and this is called the standard representation of, of the group. And uh, now you can apply the operator amplification to, 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 to this, right? We, we, we know by something that is a lambda expander, so the average of this guy over the standards that most lambda know, and you apply the operator amplification, both you, you get almost from illusion for arbitrary graphs like these, right? Uh, very good. Okay. And now let's try to amplify uh, lambda, okay? And uh, we can try to brainstorm the, the same thing that we were trying to brainstorm last time. So the first approach is take a product space, right? Uh, a product space is, again, great, right? The operator norm is multiplicative, right? Uh, so if you have something like this, it's going to break into a, a, a product like this, and the, the operator norm is going to shrink, right? Uh, exponentially fast, but too big uh, again, right? Uh, now can try, oh, let's somehow sample a, a random, let's see if a random works here. And naively, if you try to sample something random here, if you play with some version of matrix churn off that are dependent on the dimension, right? Uh, so uh, the, the, at least a naive argument using a matrix churn off bound that, that doesn't work here, right? Uh, so we, we cannot take this route. All right. Uh, okay, so we have this, uh, this is the, the, the operator amplification. And we'll, let's somehow prove it uh, or consider things in a simple set of, of this. So instead of proving this for lambda, let's relax and, and prove it for lambda squared. Because when you prove for lambda square, the collection of walks come from expander walks on a basic expander, not, not exactly this high order version of, 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 of zigzag. So, it, but, but this guy here is, is also used as, as an important piece in the near option. So this theorem, even though it's not optional, is used inside here. So we, I think it's interesting to, to have some flavor of what, what's going on here. Okay, so. Uh, one thing that we can do is like this, right? Uh, we, we have the, the auxiliary graph. It's on the vertex set S and it's an expander, right? Uh, and uh, you'd like to understand this expression. What's going on with this kind of expression here, right? Uh, you need to massage the problem to, to, to have a handle on how you can analyze this, right? Uh, this kind of expression. Uh, very good. Okay. Uh, do you know of a random way which does not get a direct no, it's a, it's a, I, I do not know personally, and I think it's a great question, right? Because uh, if you have a random one, uh, these constructions, since they are based on the expanded, there, there are some losses. So this little O that you get, it, come, it comes from using explicit algorithms. and so on. If you have a randomized version of these, you might have better parameters, right? Uh, so for the cold case, you do not have little O terms, but when you go to the explicit uh, Tashima case, you, you have little O's, right? Uh, I think it's an interesting question. But I do, I do not know how to do it. Right? But since there is an explicit construction that does that, at least some skilled distribution, some crazy <coughs> thing does it. But it could be an interest, right? A like not a, a very random thing. Okay, so we need to we need to get our hands on, on this kind of expression, neutralize it somehow. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I think I'm running short on time, but let me try to give a, a flavor. And the idea is that uh, we have this, we are going to construct an operator that's block diagonal, right? We have this function, it's a matrix valid function, and we, we put the, the matrix entries on the diagonal of, of this operator here somehow. Okay, very good, we have this pi operator. And let's, as a warm up, let's start from the scalar case. Let's say that we have uh, one by one matrices, and uh, it, this is plus minus one, even for, for simplicity, just, just to think about what's going on. And uh, okay, let's say that we take t equals to two. So you're essentially computing the average over the edges of this graph, right? Uh, so here you have this factor one over ND, and you have the summation, right? F1 uh, here, and you have the indicator of this being an edge. And this looks something very familiar, right? This looks like a, a quadratic form, right? O over the adjacent matrix of the graph. 
if you interpret f as a vector here, this is a quadratic form, right? Uh, and you, you can uh, you can divide this n factor square root n here, square root n there. You can massage it a little bit more. Now instead of having f here, you're going to have the all ones vector, the all ones vector here, and, and then you're going to put pi f here, pi f here. So it allows you to write in this way. But why th this was important, right? We want to understand this, right? Uh, but but now we have a matrix expression to, to understand the points that we want, right? Uh, that, that, that's very helpful, okay? And it's not hard to generalize these, right? Uh, so if you take longer walks instead of just two, if you take larger things, it generalizes nicely in this form, right? Uh, we have a t minus one, you have several points of, of these operators, like <coughs> things, and you have this expression. And it's great, right? You want to understand the absolute value of this thing. It's enough to understand the operator norm of whatever is going on here. And operator norm is a multiplicative function, right? Uh, you can somehow bound pieces of it and, and combine, right? Uh, so, but uh, okay, now let's go back to matrices, right? Uh, so now we have matrix valid functions, matrix valid functions. And uh, again, what you're going to have is a matrix valid function here. This one, you can think that we tensored with the identity <coughs> on L elements, right? Uh, so this is tensored with the identity. So we get an expression of this form. If you put things together again, what you're going to get is not the adjacent matrix of the original graph, but the adjacent matrix tensored with L ones. Then you here you have pi f, and here you have pi f. And, and then you get this expression here. Okay, so we, we, go, we also get an algebraic expression. And you, you can distribute the square root of n, and you got this nice algebraic expression. Things do generalize for, for larger uh, walks. If it is larger, you do get a single expression like this. And uh, I, I, again, it's a great expression, right? If you want to understand the operator norm of this part, it's an option to understand the operator norm of this other part here. Okay, very good. And the operator norm is a multiplicative function. So instead of trying to understand the full product that might be very complicated, what you do, you divide into steps, right? Uh, you take two steps here, and then you roughly divide the analysis in two steps, and then you have this ratio that t over two. So if you manage to give a good bound for this thing, well, you are done, right? Uh, okay, very good. So uh, if you manage to find a good bound for two steps, and this pi f has operator norm at most one, so you, you get this bound here. So if you, if you manage to just analyze this part, we might have a, a red trivial bound running for us. Very good. And something very similar to what happens in the zigzag analysis happens here. Right? Uh, so you have this space that's a, a tensor space. It has a component of the vertex of the, of the auxiliary graph and this Hilbert space. We have the, the parallel space, which is the all ones tensor the arbitrary vector in the other space. And you have the orthogonal <laughs> complement of this. So this tensor space decomposes nicely in this form, right? Uh, okay. And uh, if you want to understand the operator norm of some guy, you, you take an arbitrary vector and you try to see how much it shrinks the norm of this arbitrary vector. So we took the arbitrary vector, it has two components, one in the perpendicular and the one in the parallel space. And let, let's hit this vector with the operator that you want to understand the operator norm. Model. So the perpendicular part is going to interact very nicely with the adjacent matrix of the graph, right? Uh, that, and you have the parallel part. This part here, since it's interacting with the adjacent matrix of the graph, gets hit by lambda. So here you have lambda x. Uh, and then this guy here, what is this guy? What is a parallel vector? A parallel vector is a guy that's all ones in the first part and an arbitrary vector. So the, this guy does nothing to a parallel vector because it's all ones tensor an arbitrary thing. The, the adjacent matrix does, does nothing to all ones, and, and the, the identity does nothing to an arbitrary vector. Right, uh, okay, so do we collect this lambda x from here? So we have this part, it, it does nothing, right? Uh, this, this operator does nothing from here, and you have this part. Okay, now we can focus on this guy here and can decompose it further in perpendicular and parallel, right? Uh, so now we have the perpendicular part and the parallel part. The perpendicular part, when it interacts with the adjacent matrix tensor identity, it's great, right? We have a decay of, of lambda x, but now we need to understand this other part. So here you have two times lambda x, right? One coming from here, and you are left to understand what, what happens when you, you hit a parallel vector uh, and you take the parallel part. Okay, so the claim is that this construction, what it gives here, is exactly the, the operator norm, our assumption that, that we had before. Okay, so this is precisely what happens. So there is a proof, but in the interest of time, let, let, let me not go over it, but it's not a very complicated proof. So somehow there's some sort of sandwiching going on with this block matrix. 
you, you roll the proof and, and there is some sandwich and at the end you get some sort of sandwich of the average of a matrix sandwiched by, by two vectors and, and then you have the operator one here okay and if you put this together you, you get two lambda x of the auxiliary expander plus some lambda naught very good so if you go back to, to the bound you analyze two steps now you plug it back you have something of this form right then and morally you would like to think that this guy is close to lambda naught so morally you have something that decays exponentially as lambda naught to the t over two so you see we, we, we took t steps but you are only getting a lambda naught to the t over two so it's a sort of a one out of two decay right there. And, and this is going to cause this this quadratic uh, this extra quadratic loss okay so if you put in terms of parameters now so this auxiliary graph you have interest in taking a, a, a something that's close to Ramanuj. so if you take a, this is actually about lambda naught and the degree is going to be about one over lambda naught squared this quadratic trade-off that's the best that you could hope for here and the size of this collection is the size of s times the degree to the t right that, that's the number of walks that that you have of length t right and so here we saw that uh, if you have t steps the, the decay is about this much right and you declare this should be lambda right you choose t so that this becomes lambda and if you compute the parameters what is this this is one over lambda naught uh, to the two t right and, and uh, if you combine these two to recover lambda, you need to, to have a lambda to the four, right? Uh, to, to, to obtain this guy here. So you have something that's about lambda to the four plus little o. Okay. okay so that, that, that's a bad, so you, here you lost and that there's nothing that you can do about it, but here you got only one out of two and th that that's where you can work better to, to, to get something better. And uh, using now W coming from this high order zigzag, right? Of Benaroy and Tashma, we can indeed get a decay at every step. And, and, and now we have no losses, right? Uh, so the, we, we have a quadratic loss coming from the Ramanujan part, the auxiliary expander, right? Uh, which now is the Y that's helping us to randomize uh, even further. And, and, and then here we have no, no loss. And the parameter becomes quite quadratic. And then this is the near ultra amplification, almost ultra amplification. Very good. So what you have seen in this talk, right? Uh, so operator amplification gives almost from illusion uh, expander graphs from arbitrary expanders, right? Uh, uh, it preserves the case structure. So whenever you have a group that we know that there are expanding generators, you know that now there are almost from illusion uh, KD expanders for, for this group. But th th that's not all that, 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 that this flexibility of thing that we have operators and so on uh, allows you to, to obtain other forms, <laughs> different forms of expanders. So another form of expander is what is called a quantum expander. Well, let's not define it, but uh, it's, it comes from having, for, for instance, almost from illusion graphs over the symmetric group, right? Uh, so having almost from illusion over the symmetric group is very interesting. So you can get quantum expanders. You can get something that's called dimension expander, that, uh, which is a, a way of expanding space somehow, right? You have some linear maps that uh, somehow increase the dimension of, of uh, the, some spaces. You also have the notion of these monotone expanders that, that people consider that the, the edges somehow, the, the, the vertices that they are labeled with numbers from one train, and the edges, they, 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 they form monotone functions, or monotone partial functions. And, and since things do not depend on the dimension when you do a, a, a amplification, you can also get amplification for, for, for the average Kastner constant for, 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 for discrete groups. Okay. And uh, just to say, quantum expanders, they, they do have application that they allow people to, 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 uh, Detect entanglement. You can have two parties, Alice and Bob, that share potentially a very large entangled state, and uh, quantum expanders somehow that, that are protocols that uh, extend very little information and can somehow detect if they have a maximally entangled state. So that, that's one application of, of quantum uh, expanders. Okay, that, that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and let me know if you have questions. So this whole construction is strongly explicit, right? So we can use this. If they start once, yes, 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 exactly. Yes. Take like zigzag parts, like, and get like basically combinatorial, uh, strongly explicit. Yes, strong, yes, you know? yes, yes. It's important. This is strongly explicit. Yes, because it's somehow you have the I don't know. You have some expanding generator. You bring some graph, right? And you put the generator sort of on the verge of this graph. And then you, you start taking walks on, on, on this graph, right? And so it's extremely efficient, right? Uh, it, 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 if somehow you can multiply elements in this group efficiently, 
the, 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 the thing was strongly fleeced, then you can also have these whole things. And that's important because the, the, the KD graph over, for instance, the, the in Tashman's case, right? Uh, it, it was a KD graph in the of the K. And K is huge, right? For, for a code, it's an exponentially large graph, but amplification happens in a very efficient way, right? Uh, for, 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 for all these expansions as well. More questions? So to simplify, I mean, so there was this work of chair, uh, explainer work, channel, uh, tail valves. Uh -huh. Does it build upon or simplify it, or is it kind of like other one? It's slightly different. Well, you're, you're thinking about the matrix explainer channel phone? Yeah. It, it's different. Uh, then in the sense that uh, the, the multiplicative structure that, that we use here might make things potentially simple. They, 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 they use potentially harder in class. That one, but it, our, our results do not say much about their results. But we haven't tried potentially. I think that the scalar one might have some similarities, it might be a good thing to try. See if it simplifies it. Yeah. Okay, thank you.